Hello, I'm Walt Scott. And I'm Sharon Scott. And we are senior pastors of Let Go and Soar Ministries based in Weaverville, California, which is way up in Northern California, about probably an hour's drive from the Oregon border. That's right. So uh, we want to welcome you to our Wednesday Worship and the Word service. We'd like to uh, open with a word of prayer, and we hope you'll join us in the prayer and also in worship. Thank you. Thank you. Watching. That's who we are. Thanks for joining us. We're going to have our worship in the word service today. Uh, and Jim has joined us because he has not been out of Trinity County. He is not, uh, what's the word I want? He doesn't have cooties. Well, I'm, I'm not high risk. Well, he doesn't have COVID. <laughs> Let's put it there. He may have cooties. I don't know. So we're going to open with prayer. Father God, thank you so much for this beautiful day, beautiful sunshiny day. We're so grateful. We've had some rain, and now we're having a day of sunshine, and that mixture is just absolutely perfect. You know how to lift our spirits, Lord, even when we're confined to our homes. We, uh, we ask your blessing for those who could not be here today, those who have maybe been out of county and, and couldn't join us in our home and are uh, sheltering in place. For those who are in the hospital and those who are caring and all the first responders and all of our leaders, Lord, we just ask a special covering. Um, we ask, Lord, that you send angels to help them, Lord. This is such a difficult time for us all. This COVID-19 is evil and it needs to leave. And so we speak to that and we command it to do that right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we're gonna lift you up, <clears throat> excuse me, in praise and worship and we pray, Lord, that we make you grin a little bit today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I uh, had a conversation with our friend Brady Tubes, who... Hi, Beanish. Love you. <clears throat> All the way from England, huh? I uh, had a little conversation with, with Brady Tubes, who uh, had a concert here at our little house mm, two years ago, two or three years ago, I can't remember. And... Uh, when he did this song, I, I just absolutely loved it and, and realized it could be our ministry, uh, m not motto, but our ministry, what would we call a song? Uh, uh, anthem, maybe anthem. Anthem. <clears throat> because of what it says. And it's just such a fun, wonderful song. I asked him the other day if he minded if I sang it. And he said, you just go right ahead. <laughs> so God bless him. By the way, Brady is... <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the uh, uh, recording artists who's also sheltered at at home by himself, and it's really getting to him. He he misses being out. Uh, here comes Sue. He misses out being out among people. He is a person, a man of relationships, just like Jesus, and uh, he misses everybody. And I was just so blessed that uh, that he said yes. So. <clears throat> this song is about what we really need to do as the body of Christ. <clears throat> when I wake up in the morning, gonna walk in love. When the evening sun is falling, gonna walk in love. Though the troubles of the day, gonna walk in love. For whatever comes my way. See you. 
Sometimes we get in that place. Just ask God to give you his goodness. Just ask him to show you his goodness, just like Moses did. <clears throat> Moses said, I want to see your face. And God said, I'll show you my goodness. Amen. In the morning when I rise, in the morning.
when I feel like that. Um, I think a lot of us do. There's just times when this world is just, <clears throat> it's just more, sometimes we feel like it's more than we can bear. And especially when we come to a point when we realize everything on this earth is temporary. It's all temporary. Our relationships are important and what we do for the Lord is important. But this world itself the worldly experience, let's put it that way, is temporary. So if you're kind of going through that place when you're thinking, you know, <laughs> Lord, take me now. <laughs> because I think more than normal amount of people may be going through that right now. So I want to encourage you, you're here for a reason. You're here for a purpose. This world is not, well, Scripture tells us that we're not citizens of this world. We're citizens of heaven. Well, heaven is here on earth right now, if we're here, and the Holy Spirit is within us. So I want to encourage you, you're here in this place at this time for a reason. God has specifically placed you here. So just be encouraged. You're here for God. He's within you, and we're together in this saints. We need each other. So, Father God, I just lift up everyone who's watching and everyone who will watch this. It's a tough time to be in, Lord, but you created us for such a time as this. And what an honor it is to be a part of everything that's going on right now. We are your select, and you have placed us here for good reason. Lift up the hopes of everyone who's present today and everyone who's watching, Lord. And just help them to understand how very important they are and how very loved they are. Your heart, that seal this worship, and we ask that it bless your heart, Lord, and that you bless the message to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I always like to, I don't want to say be provocative, that sounds kind of funny, but um, my messages are usually a little bit different. Not that I am, just my message yes, is here. <laughs> and while it's going, yes, you are. <laughs> but in a good way, right here? Right. right. So, yeah. today's message is called Reckless Faith. And as a lot of my messages do start off, <clears throat> excuse me, God, uh, God and I were chatting. <laughs> I say that a lot. God and I were talking. <clears throat> And he brought the story of the woman who uh, had the issue of blood and how she went after touching the garment, the, the hem of, of Jesus' garment. <clears throat> and I, uh, I said, well, yeah, that's a great story, but there's got to be more to it if you're bringing it to my attention. There must be some reason. That's kind of a silly statement, but that's what I told him. <laughs> um, and he did. over. And, and it's funny, he gives me little snippets here and there, and I'll encounter someone or some circumstance or some situation that will have something to do with that message, or it'll tweak my perspective a little bit. And sometimes it's just a word that somebody says, and... And it just, it's like a little light bulb that goes off in my head, you know, it's kind of interesting. One of the things that, well, the first thing that the Lord made, uh, brought to the forefront of my attention is, this woman was a gutsy woman. And we're going to talk more about that later. I, I, I love it. The more I prayed about it, the more I really talked about it, and I've done... I've done um, <clears throat> a, uh, a monologue at a women's retreat where um, I was speaking to the women and then as I was speaking, I became that character and I put my costume on and I became that woman. Of course, I took my glasses off because I didn't have glasses back then. But 
God gave me some insight as to what she went through. And recently, I dug in deeper, and it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing story. She's an amazing woman. The, one of the most amazing things about her is we have no clue what her name is. You know, it, it's that way sometimes in Scripture, especially with women. But uh, there are some circles in, in the faith who like to call her Veronica. And you can look that one up and find out why, but I, I just, I don't know what her name was, so I'm not going to tag a name onto her. I figure if it's, you know, scripture left her without a name, I'm going to do the same. But if you think about it, she took hold of the hem of his robe. Is that correct, according to what you guys yes. did? Mm -hmm. So I have Jim and Walt and Sue Scott just joined us, Pastor Sue Scott who has not been to Reading either. She's stayed in county and she's not contagious, so she gets to come today. <laughs> We're so glad to see people. Not that I don't love my husband and he doesn't love me, but whew, I tell you, it's great. <laughs> it's great to have friends with you. You just, you don't realize how much you miss people. It's like I said last time I spoke, absence makes the heart grow fonder. So let's look to Zechariah 8.23. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten people from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you. Right. So the part that I really want to accentuate is where it says, we'll take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe. That's amazing. Now, Zechariah lived hundreds of years before Jesus, if I'm not mistaken. And scripture's just like that. I, I love that scripture is like that in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zechariah. It's astounding to me how many times we can trace back things that Jesus said or situations like this. And they talk about it in the Old Testament, way before Jesus was born. It's astounding to me. They took firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe. <clears throat> so, just kind of hold on to that for a minute. Let's look at Matthew 9, verses, well, I have 18 through 26, but I'm actually thinking about verse 22. Through 22, and I'll read this. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's out of the again uh, out of the NIV, which is what I usually use. Just then, well, let's let's back up just a little bit. Jairus, who was how many of us remember who he was? We're going to find out because we're going to read more than one version of this. In this particular verse, in this version, Matthew 9, 18 through 26, Matthew doesn't really tell us who Jairus is specifically other than to say he's a synagogue leader. Now that's really super important. You understand he's a Jew, he's a synagogue leader, leader and who is he seeking help from? He's seeking Jesus. help from Jesus. Yeah. So it says, so I will read 18. While he was saying this, this is uh, Jesus, was speaking, a synagogue leader came, and this is really astounding, if, if you get into the history and um, customs and behaviors of the people back then, this was astounding. Okay, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him. He got on his knees before Jesus and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. And what did Jesus do? He got up and he went with him. And so did his disciples. Well, we know from what happens next that his disciples were not the only ones that followed him. <clears throat> Just then, so in other words, right after that, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Now, I think we can all kind of formulate a picture of this in our minds. She had a huge crowd to get through. By that time, there were a lot of people following Jesus. 
she, and we're going to talk about why this is so amazing, but she had to get through that crowd to get to Jesus, so, which showed that she was pretty focused. She touched his cloak, and she believed that she was healed. And Jesus turned and saw her. Now again, this is, this is Matthew's version. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Keep this little version in mind, not little, keep this version in mind as we move forward a little <coughs> bit. And that was, as I was saying, that was Matthew. So we're going to go to Mark's version. In Mark's version, it names the synagogue leader, still calls him a synagogue leader. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Now there's some significance in that, and we're going to talk about that in just a little while. Uh, he pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Now remember, in Matthew, he said, what? He said, my daughter is dead. My daughter has died. But in Mark, he says, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be, so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him to Jairus. Okay, here's where we learn that it wasn't just the disciples. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. Pressed in. Large crowd. Poor Jesus. <laughs> I guess he was used to it. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now, I don't remember if... It said, yes it did, it said 12 years in the previous version. She had suffered a great deal, here's another new thing we're learning about her. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, so she was home and she heard about him, right? She came up behind him in the crowd, so she heard about him, she went where he was, and she came up behind him and touched his cloak, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized, and this is important, that power had gone out from him. Now, I don't want to use a taser as an example. That's the first thing that came to my mind. But when, uh, let's see, what would be a good thing when, when power goes out? I guess I can use a taser. You guys are grown-ups, right? Okay, when you fire a taser, you know, the electric strings that go through it, the prongs hit whatever you aim it at. Let's not get gory. But that power goes from the taser to the item. It doesn't get cut off on its own. It's the same for, okay, I can use a, a lamp, for a example. Laser. Pardon me? A laser. A laser beam, yeah. yeah. The power, it doesn't diminish the power in the item itself. It continues from the source into the thing that it is touching. So Jesus, at once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Now that's odd because, as the apostles say, um, Jesus kept looking around. Okay, not in this version. I, I, I'm sorry. I apologize for this. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. Now who else fell at his feet in this scripture? Jairus. Jairus, yeah. Jairus was a leader in the synagogue. And this woman is just a woman who has been ill. I need to just step back a little bit and explain something. In Eastern culture, it is traditional when you're in the presence of, of a leader, typically it's, it's a man who is the head of the family, but not always. It could be an elder woman. When, for instance, if you're traveling there, you get off the bus, you go up to them and you kneel down and you literally put your head down on the ground and your hands on their feet. And that is considered 
a, a sign of great honor and respect. That's one way of looking at it. So this was within their culture. This is something that you did when you. It, it's it's a um, a surrender. It's a humbling, and she did this, but not until after he figured out who did it, who it was. You know, that's the thing that kind of gets me. She decided she was trying to stay anonymous, and we're going to talk about why in a minute. But she came around and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear told him the whole truth. No, we know that Jesus knew the whole truth. He is the truth. <clears throat> he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. There's one important thing I want to say about that. Jesus knew that she came and she thought, If I just touch his clothing, I'll, get, I'll, I'll be healed. He knew it was also very important that she understand that his clothes didn't <coughs> heal her. His clothes are not what healed her. We all know that. His, he, he carried a power. He carried the power. He healed her. Well, Jesus would say, God healed you. But your faith is what healed you, your faith in God. So... Um, we, we can read through the rest of this, but it's, it's really lengthy and not applicable to what we're saying we're talking about today. But in verse 36, he was listening to other people, and um, Jairus' daughter, they said, Hey, she's dead. Um, why are you bothering the teacher? And, and Jesus said, he heard what they were saying. He said, Don't be afraid, just believe. Now that, to me, would be her scripture. Don't be afraid. Just believe. I think that's what she was telling herself. I really do. Now we're going to look at Luke. So we've looked at Matthew. We've looked at Mark. Now we're looking at Luke. Luke's version. Why are we doing this? Because they were all there. Isn't it interesting that they all tell the story their own way? And, and that's the way it always is. But it's fascinating to me. You learn so much. Don't, Folks, don't just read one version of things especially in the gospel. Yes, we want to dig into the book of John usually first. If we, we tell people um, who are new believers, read the book of John. But don't stop there. Look and just get in, dig in deep and soak in the word. And just, you'll notice that there's subtle differences, but there are additions here and things left out in this one that are in this and, and so forth. So here we are in Luke 8, uh, 45 through 56, and it talks about Jairus coming up, uh, synagogue leader, his daughter was dying. And then we pick up, uh, I guess that's still verse 42. Okay, as Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house, the crowds almost crushed him. Now see, this is a little more explicit than Mark. Mark said that he was surrounded by people, but Luke is saying the crowds almost crushed him. Now, a little background on Luke. Luke was not there. Luke interviewed many, many people. Luke wrote his Gospels to educate Theophilus. Theophilus was, at one time, his owner. He was a slave. Luke was a slave. He was emancipated. He went to school to be a doctor. And he brought Theophilus to the Lord. He is writing these things, but he wants to make sure that he gets it right and accurate. And these letters are actually to Theophilus, but we get to learn from them and be blessed from them. So he says, by, by interviewing all of these people, he says, As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now, that's three times we've heard it had been 12 years. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. <laughs> this is funny to me. Anybody else find little things in Scripture that are funny? I, I do. Um, but Jesus said, Oh, excuse me, when they all denied it, in other words, well, I didn't do it. No, did you? No, I didn't do it. Did you do it? No, I didn't do it. Well, that guy probably, no, I didn't do it. Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. 
That is fascinating to me. I read um, when I was researching this, and, and I, I have learned in the kingdom to be very open-minded because, well, first of all, if you're skeptical and suddenly you end up on your back on the floor in a church <laughs> because somebody <laughs> clapped his hands over your head, you get humble real fast and realize, oh, it does not pay to be skeptical in the kingdom. <laughs> What I'm talking about is, um, there have been people who, when they pray and they lay hands on people, and I'm looking at Sue and I'm thinking, You're one of them. but that t sometimes you can feel the power of the Holy Spirit in your hands going into that person. I've read accounts of this. I've heard pastors talk of it. I've heard. Uh, a very um, well-known healing uh, pastor speak of this. It doesn't happen every single time, but there are times when it does. So Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. He didn't say, I know my power has gone out from me. In other words, he didn't have to refill. I have actually heard people talk about that. No, <laughs> Jesus Jesus didn't have to go pray and say, Father, please fill me up. We do sometimes, but, she, you know, Jesus was a constant source of healing. We know that because he healed everybody who needed healing. If you read in uh, the loaves and fishes and the loaves, the story when he said, well, you feed him. And so they did uh, after he duplicated all of the fish and the loaves. It says somewhere in there, he went about and healed everyone. So it's astounding to me. And it doesn't say he was exhausted and had to go lay down afterwards. He wasn't depleted. He just did it. So Jesus said, uh, I know that the power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed. Now we can giggle at that and say, well, what's the big deal? It is a huge deal, and we'll talk about why. She came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he, Jesus, said to her daughter, Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Why was it such a big deal that, number one, she was in the presence of all the people and she told them what her problem was? To talk about that, we have to know a little bit of background about women at that time and about Jewish law. And, and it talks about it in the Old Testament. Um, do, and, and I'm going to try to be as delicate about this as I can, but I had three children, so you know, you know, well, Jim, we all know what goes on when you're a woman. <laughs> First of all, if she, and it did say somewhere in here, she was at least 22 years old. If she came into her maturity when she was 12 or 13, and it's 12 years later, she was probably around 24, 25, somewhere in there. At that age, you should be married and you should have children. However, if you have an issue of blood nonstop, Neither one of those things are going to happen because no man is going to go near her. Why is that? Because in Jewish law, if you even touched anything that she touched, including food, laundry, sat in the same chair, you were, you were deemed unclean. And you would have to go through a cleansing process and you were deemed unclean until that evening. So that was something that she knew in her heart, <clears throat> which I'm sure did not do much for her self-esteem. But also, everybody who knew her knew this. Can you even imagine? So people knew that she was unclean. She could not be around other people. Now friends, if you're in uh, sheltering in place, in isolation right now, you're kind of getting a little taste of what it's like, if you're totally alone, to live without 
having fellowship, without having family, without having a physical touch. She went without this for 12 long years. So when she heard that Jesus was around, oh, you betcha, she ran to where he was. <clears throat> so, I just, my heart goes out to her. When I, I think I can tell this story. When I had my first child, I'll be very careful about this, I had a C-section, and something went wrong, and I started to hemorrhage, and they had to give me three pints of blood. But, you know, glory to God, it all got fixed up, and three pints is a lot of blood. It's no joke. When you have, they call it in scripture, an issue of blood, you are low on iron, you're most probably anemic, you are very weak and tired all the time. There is no way that she could possibly have had children, for obvious reasons, we're all grown-ups here, there's no way that she could have cared for anybody. So we figure she was single. She had an income. Now remember back in, I think it was Matthew, said that she had spent all her money on what? On doctors trying to get healed. Now back then, they obviously didn't know the things that we know now. Back then, what you're probably talking about are astringents and home remedies, even though you, you were at the doctor, and, and things that are really not going to, obviously not going to do any good if it continued for 12 years. Now, the whole uh, idea of a woman going to a male doctor for this at that time was humiliating. It was awful. But she so longed to not be in the situation that she was in, childless, unmarried, alone. <clears throat> she was willing to do anything. Now, how did she get money? She most likely had a dowry, or, or not a bride price. A bride price was usually given at the time of a wedding. <clears throat> now, a dowry, there is a, a small possibility that she was married because the guy didn't know, <laughs> but I don't, I don't think even that's possible, really. But for the most part, we believe that the dowry became hers. Maybe her parents passed away. Um, maybe they just said, here, take this and get fixed. Um, but she did have her own money, but she exhausted all those funds. So we... We know that she was about 25, she was single, she had an income, a dowry. We also know that Jewish law declared her to be ceremonially unclean, ceremonially unclean due to her bleeding issue. <clears throat> uh, she could not enter the temple because of that. It's amazing. So these bleeding disorders, uh, it, it most likely was not hemophilia. I'm thinking it was probably, I don't know. I shouldn't even say that. I don't, I just don't know. Um, there is, believe it or not, in the Talmud, which is, if you're wondering what the Talmud is, it's a compilation of historic rabbis discussing or debating what the Torah means. Now, one leaf of the Talmud uh, lists not less than 11 different remedies for what she was going through. And in her day, there was nothing really that was effective. We know that. So if you want to know, well, I, I really am not comfortable reading this. If you want to know exactly what she was going through, read Leviticus 15, verses 25 through 27. Leviticus 15, verses 25 through 27. And anyone, as I was saying before, anyone who knew about her illness would shun her. She couldn't go about in society. She couldn't go to the market. She couldn't mingle in the marketplace with other women. Um, just one touch from her would make someone unclean, as we were saying before. There are ceremonial uh, occasions like weddings. She couldn't go. Uh, uh, a bris or a... a in other words, uh, circumcision, which was very symbolic. 
very important. She couldn't go. Uh, she couldn't worship in the synagogue. So she was resorting to secrecy. <clears throat> Her condition was carefully concealed, we think, maybe, but she comes with what I like to, to call audacity. Now we're kind of getting to the point of our message today. She had, excuse me, she had the absolute audacity to go into a crowd of people. Knowing what we do now, imagine if they found out what would have happened. If they're, let's just, being careful the way we say this, evidence on her clothing of what was going on in her body. What would have happened to her? It's really amazing to think of. She was, she had this audacity about her, thinking, well, if I can just touch his clothing. To reach Jesus, she must push and shove and elbow her way between people when tiny openings occurred. She's weak, her strength is drained, and yet she will not give up. She must reach Jesus, and so she continues to wedge her body through the crowd until she comes up behind him. And Jesus felt the flow of power out of him. I've never heard anywhere else in Scripture where Jesus said this. I don't believe it appears anywhere else, which is really interesting. Whenever something is only said one time in Scripture, it's very significant. So he, uh, uh, let's see, make sure that I don't repeat myself here. Yeah, the, the irony of the whole situation is dozens of people, dozens of people were touching him. You know they were. And m maybe mostly men, I don't know, but women were pretty subdued at that time, sometimes. Um, but she did not care. She was reckless in her determination to touch the, the hem of his garment and to receive his power, his healing power. She was relentless in her pursuit. And that, to me, is amazing. Mm -hmm. She was a sick but very determined woman. So, who else in Scripture had reckless faith like that? I have, uh, well, I'll have to show this book. This is, this book is called, make sure that I get it to you, All the Women of the Bible. I have a couple of copies of this, All the Women of the Bible. We have this in our, in our center, in our reference library, in our lending library. And I have a few different, how's my time? What, what time is it? I think it's... It's... 1.30. Yay! I'm doing good. Okay. So, I'm just going to talk about a couple of women here and some men in the Bible who have this reckless faith. Abigail is somebody that I'm thinking, who's Abigail? And then I started reading. Now, you may remember the story of Nabal of Carmel. Who's he, right? Um, Abigail was wife to Nabal of Carmel, and he was a wealthy herder of sheep and goats. And one of the, one of the, I'm not quite sure who it was, but one of the men came to her, which tells you something about her. He came to her and said, do you know what your husband just did? <laughs> and she says, he what? Now David, we all know who David is, right? David was passing through, and this man, this is such a huge, huge, huge mistake, <laughs> refused, uh, he called David a runaway slave and refused him food for his men, though there was plenty prepared for the shearers, the servant exclaimed. So in other words, there was lots of food prepared, but this guy refused to give him any. This is David, guys. You know, slap my forehead. What is wrong with this man? So David insult, or excuse me, Nabal insulted David. And Abigail, and this is why I admire her so much. She says, 
Okay, this is what we're going to do. I want you to get that, and I want you to get that. I want you to do that, and you prepare that. This is already prepared. Get this on an animal and get it out there to him right now. I will follow you. And so they did. They, Of course, they listened to her, you know. And she learned that there were five sheep already prepared, two skins of wine and a hundred bunches of raisins in the storeroom, five measures of roasted grain in the bin, and 200 cakes of figs in the cooling room. And then so they, they got them all together on donkeys and they took it out. And she says, excellent. Uh, then Jacob, will you see to it that the stores are packed on two and the third fitted with a saddle and bridle? So two donkeys or, yeah, two of them, Two of the donkeys had stores on them, and the third one, she was going to ride. So she got on there, and she went up to David, which was very bold. And let's see if I can find it in here. She went up to David, and, oh, she says, oh, yes, and don't forget the wine. <laughs> she said, uh, let's see, find it down here. Oh, yeah, this is very important. Riding behind the provisions, Abigail kept a sharp watch, and as they reached the promontory, she saw David coming toward them. David armed with an armed troop. This is where, in a movie, you would hear the dun-dun-dun. <laughs> she caught her breath, slid off the mule, and prostrated herself before him. Now, what does that mean? From what we've been talking today about... To prostrate yourself in front of someone, exactly, you are on your face. <laughs> and uh, by the way, it is possible when someone prostrates themselves in front of you in, the, in Eastern tradition to rebuke them by stepping back and say, don't touch me. You know you're in it deep if that happens. It's, it's horrible, horrible. So David armed with an armed troop. She caught her breath, slid off the mule, and prostrated herself before him, still not knowing what she was going to say. That's what a lot of prophets will say. It's people who get, who the Lord says, okay, I want you to go talk to that person over there. Um, what do you want me to say? Oh, you'll find out when you get there. <laughs> Buck Steele comes to mind, right? Mm -hmm. Then the words came. She said, I'll take the blame. Pay no attention to Nabal. He really is a brut as brutish as his name. No sense at all. I didn't see your soldiers. My prayer for you is that the Lord God who kept you from spilling blood with your own hands to avenge yourself, when was that? Say what again? What was that last part? So remember, uh, the Lord God who kept you, David, from spilling blood with your own hands to avenge yourself. Remember oh, when... So. Yes, he so cut off cave. a piece in the cave. Yep. Saul uh, was relieving himself, mm -hmm. shall we say, and he cut off a piece of right. his garment, right? Right. He could have killed him easily, chose not to. He had another time, too. Yeah, and yeah, mm -hmm. I don't remember where that one was. The, camp. the Lord God who kept you from spilling blood with your own hands to avenge yourself will give, you, will give all your enemies Nabal's fate. Please. Give the provisions I've brought your soldiers and to your soldiers, and please forgive our ingratitude. You're fighting the Lord God's battle. Surely He will give you a lasting dynasty. For your you haven't an evil bone in you. Uh, smart woman. And then, when the Lord God has saved your life, defeated your enemies, given you rule over Israel, and kept all His promises to you, you'll be glad you took no vengeance on us. And when the Lord God has rewarded you. Remember us. Now, mm. that is one brilliant, audacious, reckless woman mm -hmm. in so many different ways. I love that story. I think we can all agree that... Uh, oh, and, and let's, let's not forget to tell the end of that story. Yeah. Laban was... Right? He lost his life. Lord took him out. And David yeah. came back... And took her in marriage. Yep. She became his wife. That's amazing. Another one that might be obvious to a lot of us is Esther. Esther is, uh, was a young girl. She was, she didn't know what was going on, but she sure learned quickly when her 
some people say it was his, her cousin, some people say his, her uncle, but... So I think it says uncle in there. And his name was, um, sorry, brain fade, uh, Mordecai. Okay, okay, I was right, I was right. Uh, Mordecai said, your people are going to get slaughtered. I know you haven't told any of these people in the castle or in the, in the king's palace that you're a Jew, but your people are going to get slaughtered unless you go to the king. Well, first of all, women, nobody went to the king but when, uh, unless he called them, unless he summoned them. And he had a staff with, uh, I think it was a gold orb on it, and he could point. So she didn't wait for him to summon her. She just went right in there. And he was surprised. And he says, okay, come on in. But before that, her uncle said... In Esther, I think it's 4.14 or 7.14, the quote that we've been hearing so much about lately, who knows but that you were created for such a time as this. And what Esther says right about that, when she realizes she's going to have to go to this king, she's just going to have to walk right in whether he calls her or not. She says, I'm going to do this. If I die, I die. Now that, my friends, is audacity. It's reckless. It's strong. And it's a decision based upon, uh, I'm going to think of others first. Which was also Abigail's. I'm thinking of others first. So another person, another woman, that we certainly don't want to forget is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Don't you know if she had a choice? Put yourself in her place. You're a 14-year-old girl, and now 14-year-olds are a lot younger than they were back then. They were marrying age back then, or at least they were engageable. You know, you could, you could become engaged at that time for one year, and then when you were 15, you could marry. But uh, back then, if you were engaged, that was considered marriage. It's real interesting dynamics. But Mary, when the angel Gabriel came to her um, and said, fear not, I have great news, you know, told her what was going on, she had a choice. She could have said, oh, no, 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 you're not doing that to me. But she didn't. What did she say? Mary said, may it be done unto me according to to your will, to God's will. Here I am, God's handmaid. Let it be done to me as you have said. And of course, we all know that wasn't the only time that she was reckless. I mean, throughout Jesus' life, there's so much that we don't know. But remember the time at the wedding when Jesus said, well, first of all, they ran out of wine, which is disgraceful in a Jewish wedding. Their wedding celebrations lasted, I think it was six days, six to seven days normally. And they ran out of wine. And she went to Jesus and she said, son, they're out of wine. You need to do something. And he said, it's not my time yet, mother, you know, woman, mother. And she just, she gave him the look. <laughs> I love it. The, the, it's like son you know she was still his mother however she knew that he was the son of god she knew he was messiah she knew who she was talking to and she did it anyway obey me now is what i used to tell my kids and basically that's kind of what she was saying you know but not quite so brashly but that was a bold move. I love that. I love it. I've seen it portrayed in, in many different uh, movies, but I just love that. She just gave him the look, like, son. <laughs> he said, today we can envision Jesus going, okay. <laughs> <laughs> also, there's Mary, Martha, and Lazarus's, that's a mouthful, Lazarus's sister. Interesting when uh, she, so Lazarus has been raised from the dead and they're celebrating and she's thinking she's looking at Jesus and she's thinking what can I do 
What small thing can I do to repay you for what you've done for us? Thinking of the Lord. So she remembers, she has an alabaster jar of pure spike nard, which was very expensive. I think it's a year's wages is, is what we read in scripture. Mm -hmm. She'd been saving it, as Martha had told her to, for her own wedding. And when that hadn't happened, she'd just gone on saving it. And she's thinking about that, what am I saving it for? Now, I always kind of wondered, you know, I, I believe the Lord said she's preparing me for burial, but I think in Mary's mind, um, and, and this is something I think living here in this arid, dry climate, we can all understand if we look at the bottom of our feet and the backs of our heels, what it would be like to have dry feet. They were dirty because they'd been washed. If he was in Martha and Mary's and Lazarus's house, they had washed his feet, but they were dry. Just for the same reason they put, would put oil on people's heads because Everything is dry. Your hands are dry. Your feet are dry. Mary not only poured it out on his feet, this oil, but she massaged it in. And she kept doing it. And even though Judas said, what are you doing? You could have sold that and fed so many hungry people. And I'm thinking to myself, uh-huh. <laughs> but she kept going. She sat at his feet. She anointed them, and she made personal, physical contact with the feet of Jesus. That, that's just, I have to stop for a minute and think about that. She laid ha her hands on his feet, and she rubbed in the soil. I heard a, a, a speaker once say, realize this, Jesus smelled, smelled like this spike nard when she was done. But so did she. And wherever she went, people could smell that fragrance. And if they smelled Jesus, they would know that the two of them had been together, which is really amazing. But she rubbed it into his feet. Now, can you imagine? I think we probably can. Who doesn't love a good foot rub? <laughs> you know? Oh my goodness, he loved it. And they were belly aching at him. He's going, leave her alone. You know, I love it. So he, took, he knew her heart. That was pretty amazing that she did that. For a lot of other reasons too, but we'll stick with that for right now. Now let's talk about the guys. What about Abram, who eventually became Abraham, correct? Abram got a word from God. He said, I want you to go. And so I picture him standing in the doorway, all packed up and ready. And he says, okay, God, where do you want me to go? And he says, and God does this to me so many times. You'll know when you get there. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know as you, I'll, I'll, I'll lead you as you go. Now, did Abram say, well, no, I'm not going anywhere until you tell me where. No, he didn't. He took that first step, and he did it. He did exactly what Father God said. Now, that is audacity. That's reckless because he had a wife. He had a kid, right? I think at that time, yes, he did. Um, he was a, a, he had been established in the community, and he just picked up and left. That's amazing, folks. To me, that's just amazing. He was going to do God's will, and he didn't really care what it looked like. He was just going to do God's will. How many of us know that a lot of times being obedient to God can be reckless, look reckless, especially to family who say, what are you doing to missionary families? You know, it's, People uh, retire like Walt and I are retired, and they decide to go on a mission. Their families think they're nuts if they're not you know, in that same uh, vein, shall we say. So that's, uh, that's Abraham. Another one that just popped in my mind, I don't want to forget it. We'll talk about him later. But um, then we have Noah. That's kind of a no-brainer. First of all, they didn't have rain back then. It didn't rain until Noah finished the ark. 
I didn't yeah. realize that until it's later in life. Years. Yeah, isn't that yeah, astounding? Yeah. Yeah. But he heard this word from God, and he did it. I'm, I'm sure he was probably saying, what's a boat? <laughs> but he did it exactly according to the specifications of God. And don't you know how glad he was that he did? And so was his family. Mm -hmm. That was reckless, according to other people. It was, he, he had the audacity to believe that he was hearing from God. And yet, he was obedient. Amen? Mm -hmm. And what about Moses? Moses gave up everything. He was in a, 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 a palace. He was catered to as the son. He was favored. He had everything he could possibly want. And what did he do? He left everything to be with his people. Everything. And when he stood up for and defended a slave that was being beaten, he actually murdered somebody. Now, if that's not reckless, and he knew that somebody had seen him do it, so he took off and left for 40 years, right? Hmm. So that whole picture, and that's just a part of Moses' life. I mean, anybody who says to the Lord God, who we know if we see him face to face back then in, in biblical times, I'm going to die if I see him, <laughs> you know. And what does Moses say to him? We even sing, uh, Jim and I do, Show Me Your Face by Don Potter. Show me your face, Lord, show me your face. That is reckless. And, I mean, he, he had the audacity to ask God to show him his face. That's amazing. So how about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I'm not going in that furnace. <laughs> not one of them said that. Every single one of them said, okay, let's do this. God's going to be with us. And they stepped into the furnace. Folks, these are all stories that if you're not familiar with them, in this day and age, if you have a smartphone, you can Google it. Look up these stories. They are astounding. But talk about a reckless thing to do. Stepping into a furnace that just being next to it would fry anybody. And they came back out. But there was a fourth man in there with them. And that fourth man, we believe, was Jesus. There's Daniel, and there are other, so many, Joseph, so many stories of reckless faith. People who said, well, I don't care what you say, I am not going to change my faith in God. The one that I would like to close with today is Peter. Now, Peter was a reckless person before Jesus came to him. I mean, he was, from what we understand, he was a pretty, he was a character. You know, he, uh, we, don't, we don't know specifics, but I've seen him portrayed as being a party animal. <laughs> I've seen him portrayed as somebody with a hot temper. And, uh, you know, a spontaneous person and, and so on. But the, the one part of scripture that I want to take you to is when he stepped out of the boat. And then there's another one, too, that just came to me. Thank you, Lord. Jesus was in a boat full of guys, and they're going, it's a ghost! You know, Jesus comes walking on the water, and they're freaking out. They don't know what they're seeing. It's a ghost! Oh, my gosh, we're going to die! And Peter recognized Jesus. And Jesus said, don't worry, it's me. And Peter says, okay. If it's you, then call me to me. Call me to you. In other words, I know you can make me walk on water. Whoa. Folks, if that's not reckless and audacious, I don't know what it is. He got up and he stepped out. And what did he do? He walked on water. When he took his eyes off of Jesus and on the storm, and this will preach if nothing else does, what happened? He began to fall. Jesus, in my imagination, says, silly man. <laughs> he said, oh, you have little faith. And he reaches down and he picks him up and they get in the boat. That whole story is amazing to me. The other part about Peter that I love is when Jesus says, 
who do they say I am? And they say, well, the prophet or uh, uh, the name. Elijah. Elijah. Elijah, thank you. Yeah, it just kind of skipped right out of my, it came out this year right here. Um, Elijah, et cetera, et cetera. They were coming up with all this stuff, and I'm reading this going, what? They're all dead guys, you know. And so they, they thought about things a lot differently back then. But Jesus said, so who do you think I am? Now, Peter's not the only one there. And if ever there was a time in Scripture where these guys were going, oh, dang, I wish I would have said that, it was when Peter said to Jesus, what did he say? You are the Christ, the Son mm -hmm. of the living God. Yeah. And Jesus said, you can only come from this knowledge from the Father. And then after that, he said, your name is Peter, or uh, Cephas, Peter. And no, on this rock, rock, I will build my church. So Peter was an audacious person, but he was not a good speaker. And if we go fast forwarding to Pentecost, what we know to be Pentecost today, when they were in the room and suddenly Holy Spirit came like flames of fire on, over their heads and they all began speaking in tongues, in other words, languages that they did not know. And the, the entire area, everybody, there were, uh, from all reports, there were over 3,000 people there, but they heard this. And imagine everybody in our little town, we have less than 4,000 people, everybody just glommed over to the courthouse because they heard a noise. That, that's impactful. They all went and they, they said, what is going on? These, they're drunk, you know. Peter, who did not speak well, and was this other, this person, suddenly steps into the threshold of the door. <clears throat> and becomes who God created him to be. He opens his mouth and proceeds to tell them they're not drunk. It's only 9.30 in the morning, which is kind of a normal statement. But then he begins to tell everyone that this is a fulfillment of Scripture, and he tells them about the Scripture, and then he tells them about Jesus. Now that was bold. It was reckless because what if they didn't receive him? And it was just, it took a great deal of audacity to just step out there and take charge, especially somebody who was not a public speaker. So what happened, 3,000 people were saved that day. Peter, his speech brought 3,000 people to believe in Jesus. And don't you know those people took it home to their hometowns because they were from everywhere. That person took it home, spoke to his family. This person spoke to their family. This person spoke to the village where they came from. Do you see how being reckless and having audacity can be an act of faith that we're called to do, saints? Um, I know a lot of people feel very timid. Well, so did Peter, so did a lot of other people. We're not called to be timid in this time. We are called to be warriors for the faith. We're called to be actively involved in this world. We're called to use our reckless faith by being obedient to God in whatever way he calls us to be. If he says, I want you to go on Main Street and just walk up to people and start preaching the gospel, how many of us would really do that? How many of us would actually do it? I think you would have second, you, you would second guess yourself saying, nah, that, that, that wasn't, I'm just imagining that. God didn't tell me that. Well, that's easy. It's easy. It's an easy way out and it's a coward's way. And we're not cowards. We're warriors. Warriors for Christ. So I want to encourage you today, get into the Word, find a book that, and this is just women, there, there are a lot, I don't mean it that way. This is only speaking of the women in the Bible. It is a great book. It has stories, as I was reading to you, stories behind many of the women in the Bible um, based upon Scripture.
kind of getting you into their map of the world as well it says getting them into imagining what it was like put yourself in the place of those who met jesus in person made the decision to follow him and then did it did what they told him to do our great commission is matthew Matthew 28. Mm -hmm. Matthew 28, last verse. At the end, I can't remember. The very last verse in Matthew. Yeah. Read it. Find out just exactly what it is God has for you to do. That's what you're here for. It's. I've heard somebody say, well, I'm not an evangelist. <laughs> yes, you are. If that's what God chooses for you to do with that person at that moment in time, that is what you are. Now, the next day he may call you to do something else, give a prophetic word to somebody, or teach someone. Just do it. Just do it. Have reckless faith. Be bold enough to get out there and do what it is we are created to do, because the time is short. The day is coming. I do not want to face my Savior and have him ask me, well, what did you do with the gifts I gave you? And not have a good answer. Well, he already knows the answer anyway. Mm -hmm. But the point is this. How much do you love Jesus? I'm not trying to guilt you. I just want you to consider how much do you love Jesus? What are you willing to do for him? Whatever it is, folks, I guarantee you it is not dying on the cross. So God bless you. Thank you for watching. And I just want to pray, pray us out here. Um, we're going to have another prayer at the end of the video to, to invite anybody who would like to receive Christ as Savior or renew your covenant with Jesus. But right now, Father God, I just pray that in this message you've reached the heart of people, that you've lit that fire under them, that you have just encouraged them, shaken them up a little bit, helped them to really examine what their faith looks like. Is it reckless enough? Lord, inspire every person who's watching and listening today for that specific thing that you created for them to do. Bless them, Lord, with courage, energy, and strength to run this good race. I thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. We thank you for being here, Holy Spirit, and we bless your holy name. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 If you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to do that right now. You have nothing to lose and eternity in heaven to gain. So please pray with us right now. God, I have not lived my best life, but I really want to. I know now that Jesus died on the cross so that my sins can be forgiven. And he came to earth so that I can live life to the fullest. I ask you now to forgive my sins, past present, and future. I ask that you come into my life as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you prayed that prayer with us, you are now a new creation in Christ. Find a good Bible church and surround yourself with people who will help you on this journey to get to know God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. Join a home group and a Bible study. You are now a member of our family. We'd love to hear from you. You can comment below this video and uh, uh, other contact information is at the end of this video on a slide you'll see. God bless you and thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you again real soon, maybe next week. Thanks for watching.